Good morning. Welcome to our service here at Galilee Baptist Church. I hope that this day finds you well. Thank you for uh, tuning in, I guess you could say, or looking us up and finding us here. And so we want to share with you the truth of God's word so that you can reach the world. That's our purpose here at Galilee Baptist Church. So let's go ahead and begin this morning uh, and turn, if you would, over to Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21. And I'm really, I'm finishing out the series. The main title was Racism, Riots, and Righteousness. And this is really part six in a sense. But we're, we're looking at the last three weeks, does righteousness matter today? And so we looked at, we'll, we'll just go over those briefly and get to really the third main point in that aspect of does righteousness matter today? Our key text for this series was in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Again, Proverbs 14, 34. Let's go ahead and pray and then we'll get into the message. Father, thank you again for your love. Thank you again for the truth of your expectations of us. Thank you for your plan and your purpose. Thank you for how you reveal yourself to us in your word. And I pray as we look at your, your word here this morning that you would use it to bring honor and glory to your name, that you would use it to edify your people, and you would use it, Lord, to reach someone with the truth of the gospel, that they may know the joy of being born again. So bless our time here. Thank you for this opportunity and this uh, means by which we can get the gospel out. Again, thank you for our time here. We know uh, you desire to bless your word. And so we ask that you fulfill your promise uh, to us. Give me strength now for this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, as we've been going through this, we, 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 the last three weeks we focused on that word righteousness. Righteousness exalteth the nation. And so righteousness is really the standard God has set for humanity. And the most basic components of that as described in God's word is the, is the Ten Commandments. And Jesus summarized those Ten Commandments and really all of the Word of God with, with two uh, great commands. And one was to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second's like it, not quite at the same. It's, it's second to it, not first. It's second. Uh, that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And he says that's all the, all the law and the prophets hang on those two truths. And so thinking about righteousness, we, we started off three ways that righteousness uh, must be understood and then followed in your life. And so the first one we saw, the actions of the people. And again, we're thinking of Proverbs 13, 43, or 14, 34, sorry. Righteousness exalteth the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And under that, we looked at Leviticus chapter 19, verses 9 through 18, and saw five ways that a society... Uh, interacts with each other to be righteous. And the final one there was that command that Jesus mentioned was to love your neighbor as yourself. It's there in Leviticus 19. And then the second thing, we saw the action of leaders and we made note that 46 times the word righteousness is used with the word judgment uh, in, in, like I said, 46 verses. And, and it often pointed to the responsibilities of leaders that is those who God has given authority over a country. And so God says, hey, it, it, government is to have righteous justice. That's the idea of putting righteousness and judgment together. Righteous judge justice upon those who do evil in a society. Because God says as that is done, then, then there'll be protection, there'll be peace, There'll, there'll be stability in that, that, that region that God says that's done. And so God's going to hold every leader, uh, any kind of government authority, in, in going to hold them accountable for the decisions they make that either promote or demote uh, that idea of, of righteous justice. In fact, we notice that, that in Isaiah chapter 9, speaking of, of Christ's future kingdom uh, and his, his government, that it says it's on his shoulders, he takes responsibility for it, that there will be that same righteousness and justice there. So the righteous justice will be something that Jesus rules his future kingdom by. 
And then the third one, which we're looking at this morning, I'm call it, so we've seen the actions of the people, God, God says righteousness. Uh, the actions of leaders, God says righteousness. And then to, this morning, we're going to look at the actions of the Lord, okay? And, and so we'll, we'll look at how he is righteous and how it connects with, his, with who he is and what he does. So the first point under that of the actions of the Lord is God's righteous character. You know, when God wrote the expectations of righteousness for people and for leaders, it, it, it was based upon himself, uh, that, that he is righteous. And God has said, okay, this is the righteousness that is mine that I expect from humanity and I expect from leaders. It's tied in back with who God is. And, and really, in a sense, you could say those those um, requirements for leaders, those requirements for people are, are really what God would, would subject himself to, the standard he would set for himself if he lived upon this earth. And we know that he did in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Lord Jesus lived that holy and righteous life. And one day when he sets up government, he will show in his leadership that same thing. In fact, he showed it really in his first coming as well, in a sense. So when, when you're thinking about God, God's righteousness and, and you know, looking at that, his, his, his character, there are three things just to real quick uh, make note of. And, and the first one is, is he is righteous in his person. And in 2 Chronicles 12 and verse 6, it says, Whereupon the princes of Israel and the king humbled themselves and they said, The Lord is righteous. Now, in the context there, Israel is, is uh, humbling itself before God. They're confessing their sin. And there's an obvious contrast between humanity and their sin and God and his righteousness. And so God is righteous through and through. He is, he is holy. That's what he is. That's all he is. And, and there's no unrighteousness in him in any way. So, so we see that righteous character in his person. We also see it in his desire. Psalm 11 verse 7 says, For the righteous Lord loveth righteousness. His countenance doth behold their upright. And then Psalm 33 and verse 5 says, He loveth righteousness and judgment. There's those two terms connected together. The Lord is full of the goodness of the Lord. So, so when God makes choices, He makes choices toward righteousness because that's what He loves. He loves righteousness. So I, I put his decisions, his ambitions, his uh, delights, his satisfaction are, are all in the realm of righteousness. If it's, if it's in the realm of evil, God says, I have no delight there. I have no love there. I have not, you know, he loves sinners, but the fact of, of just himself in that, God says, I don't, I don't want, to want to be there. So there's no delight or desire for anything that's unrighteous or sinful or we evil uh, in the Lord. So we see in his person, in his desire, and in his actions, Psalm 145, verse 17 says this, The Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So God's actions are always right. They're always righteous because they go according to his righteousness. And really, that, that is an essential understanding of God. God is righteous in his person, in his ambitions, and in his actions. He is always righteous. Right, And I think that's sort of the truth behind James 1.13. Uh, you're familiar with that. He said, let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Now think about it. He cannot be tempted with, there's no desire. There, you know, for us in our sinful nature, even though we're saved, you know, there's, there's a hook. You know, that the, the devil throws out there and tries to get us to, to bite on that, that hook and tries to draw us into sin. But there's, there's no desire in, in God uh, for, for evil things. There's only desire for righteousness. So, so he cannot be tempted with evil. And then it says, neither tempteth he any man. There's no ambition in the heart of God to ever do anything unrighteous toward any human being. Okay, He loves humanity. And though he will bring judgment and bring justice, he... He, he, he has no ambition in his heart for anything that's malice. So, so God has no desire for evil or to do evil to anybody. Uh, that's who God is. That's what he does. As the verse again says, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. So that's God's righteous character. Just quickly summarize. And the second point we want to look at, letter B here, is God's righteous justice. 
as, as, as we've already made mention of, but kings and rulers in ancient times and even in modern times, they sit in the halls of government as a representative of God. That's what Romans 13 tells us. And that doesn't mean that every one of their decisions are, are, uh, are righteous or are right, okay? But it does mean that God will hold them accountable for governing in a, in a righteous manner or in a God-honoring way. So just as the king of a land, God says you're supposed to have righteous judgment, so God, the, the, the king of the world, will bring righteous judgment. Justice, what he expects is what he does. And so because he's a sovereign ruler and righteous judge, therefore he will, he will bring sin, uh, he will make sin accountable and he will bring justice upon every evil and wicked thing in this world. Sometimes in time, as we will see, but also obviously in eternity. And, and so God is, will bring justice. And so we're looking at his righteous Justice, And so here in our text that we read this morning of Psalm 42, I guess we haven't read it yet, in verse 21, uh, let, let me just read it there. I had to turn there first and then mention Psalm uh, Proverbs 14, 34. It says um, in verse 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. There's our, our concept or our term. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. So in this passage, a little bit earlier, I think it goes back to you know, 18 or so, um, 17, 18, Israel has, has fallen into the way of sin. And they've been doing it for a while. And, and God many times has called out to them, sent them prophet over and over and again, had, had sent them uh, you know, his truth in, in a variety of ways. And they have, they have purposely left God out. And so God says, you, you guys are, are deaf. And you guys are, are uh, blind. And, he, and so he says, let the blind see. Now that's an interesting statement. The blind can't be commanded to see. Uh, but but so, so what God's talking about is you have purposely made yourself blind to what I'm doing in your life and doing in your situation. And you're deaf to my truth that I'm trying to, trying to get across to you. And because they've refused over and over again, God says, I'm going to bring judgment upon you. And you're going to face that justice. And you're going to feel the captivity into Babylon. You're going, to, you're going to face trouble and anxiety and fear and heartache. All those kind of things. And then in the middle of that, verse 21, he says, The Lord is well pleased with his, for his righteousness sake. And it's almost saying that, you know, well pleased, he's satisfied that he's, he's doing the right thing, the righteous thing. Thing. In other words, he's not gone contrary to, as we saw earlier, he's not gone contrary to the righteousness of his nature or the righteousness, uh, his righteous uh, desires, the things he loves, or, or he's not gone contrary to righteous actions. It is all justified. And so God's not, as he does these things to Israel and brings justice, he says, hey, it's righteousness. And then it says he will magnify the law and make it honorable. See, God's righteous actions and desires was spelled out in the law. Now, I think that's speaking broader than just the, the, the law of Moses, probably all the written, uh, written uh, Old Testament that was, was um, in, in uh, Isaiah's day up to that point in time. There were some things written a little bit later, but up to that day. And so, so God says, hey, I've told you what I'm like. I've told you what would happen. I've told you the consequences of sin. I've told you of the blessing of following a righteous path. And so he said, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to magnify that truth by fulfilling it. And when it's fulfilled, people will see it being fulfilled and then they will honor my word once again. That's the, the concept. So these people would see it and magnify the God who said those things. And so God, uh, or the law, as, as I said, is, is God's written Word and it tells of God's righteous standards that he expects from others, tells about his righteous loves, the things that he desires, tells about, uh, you know, that he is righteous. All those things are spelled out in the word. Now, now we, as it says there, to, to honor the word, to magnify the law. Now, we, we don't worship the Bible, okay? We worship God, okay? And that's, that's important for us to understand. But, but because God has written his word, Word And in fact, he's, he's written it in such a way that God's people ought to say that, hey, that's what he's speaking to me about today. 
As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. Inspiration is a term that means to exhale. It is God breathing out. And that's the concept, is when you speak, you don't speak breathing in. Hello there, speaking in. You can't do that. You speak out. You, you, and that's why, you know, with the, with the uh, uh, COVID, you know, that they say the droplets from your mouth when you're speaking out or when you sneeze, obviously, or cough. Um, but, but the idea is, is, you know, God's word, we, we magnify it, we honor it because we see it as God speaking to us. And that's, that's the truth of it. And we all should, all should have a, a sense of honor and awe for it um, because it's, it's showing us the way of a righteous path that God wants us to follow. So it's interesting in this verse, and, and I want to point out this, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. There's a connection between God's righteousness and the law. And there's a reason for that because, as, as I've said already, that God's word, God's written word, lays out the, 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 righteous, the, the righteous standard of God, lays out what God expects people to do, the conduct that he would have humanity to, to, to follow. And then at the same time, his righteousness and the law are also connected because it tells us about God and what he will do in relationship to man's following that righteousness. So his righteousness is displayed uh, whenever he, he judges um, uh, according to what he has written. And God's righteousness is also displayed whenever he blesses people according to what is written. Because he's keeping his word. He's following his righteous path. He's demonstrating his righteous character. He's showing his love for righteousness. And in showing that love for righteousness, he also brings justice to that which is evil. In fact, notice how far Israel had gone in verse 25. Therefore he hath poured upon him, speaking there of Israel is the hymn there, poured upon Israel the fury of his anger and the strength of battle. In other words, they would be overcome in, in battle as Babylon came in. And it hath set him, that's, that's Israel, set him on fire round about. And so I think he's speaking of that judgment is like, okay, all around, judgment's coming. Okay, not literally set on fire, though there may have been fires involved, but he's not saying the whole, whole country was going to be burned down, but he likens judgment to fire. Yet, so, so notice that for, it has set him on fire round about, yet he, Israel, knew not, and it burned him. He felt the consequences to sin, yet he laid it not to heart. Wow, they, they, God says, I'm, I'm dealing with you in judgment and you, you, you're, just, you're, you're, you're deaf to the truth I'm trying to communicate to you. Get right with me. He said, you're, you're blind to the reality of what's happening to you even though you're facing consequences to sin. In fact, but, but let, I'll show you one other thing and, and this will sort of come into play a little bit later though I won't refer back to it. But verse 43, remember the, the verses came in a little later as Isaiah's writing. He says in verse 43, verse 1, Chapter 43, I'm sorry, verse 1. But now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by my, thy, thy name, thou art mine. God says, you know, you, you, have, you have ignored me, you have forsaken me, you have, you have gone your own way, you're following your own course, and yet I am coming to rescue you. Wow, what, what love God has for us in the midst of our sin. But so, so the first point there is, is this aspect of the declaration through Isaiah that God's righteous justice will come. And it's connected with that law. He's fulfilling what he said. And now I want us to go over to the New Testament. Go over to Romans chapter 1. And so the explanation of this, this righteous justice of God. I want, to, I want to see how Paul explains it in Romans 1. Romans is a book that that's often speaks of righteous, righteousness, being righteous, being just, justifying, which means to be made righteous. Um, you know, it's over and over again in this book, and you can look that up sometime in a concordance, uh, whether on your computer or in a book. Um, but, but jump over to chapter 1, verse 18 of, of Romans 1. So Romans 1, verse number 18. So we saw the explanation through Isaiah about God's 
righteous justice. It's connected with him and his in the law. And now we're going to look at Paul's explanation uh, of God's righteous ju justice. Notice verse 18, for the wrath of God. Now God's wrath, remember, that's his his righteous justice. That's in wrath, we think of anger, but that's not the concept so much of God. Though he's angry at sin, the idea is, okay, he's not, he's not losing his cool, okay, and, and losing his self-restraint. No, he's, he's what God's, the reason he uses wrath and anger when he talks about his, his justice upon, his judgment upon sin is because it does infuriate him, but it's not that he's losing control in how he expresses that justice that needs to come. So the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Okay, God's going to show it to us against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. These people have not followed God. They've not followed his standard. They're ungodly, godless, and they're rightless. Okay, they're not following his, his directions. And it says they hold the truth in unrighteousness. The idea of they're holding on to the truth in the sense of like a stranglehold. You know, they're, they're suppressing it. They're putting it away. They don't want to see it. They don't want to know it. Okay, and so, so God's righteous justice is given out into the evils of this world. Now, I'm not going to read verses 19 through 23, but it really describes human rejection of God. They, they had a sense of God, but they didn't follow God. They didn't thank God. They didn't, didn't glorify God as, as, as God. And, and they turned their own way and they made their own idols. And, and so God then explains how his wrath, his his righteous justice would fall upon uh, human society. So jump down to verse 24. It says that as they, in verse 23, they changed the glory of God into images. So they started to worship God both in things they made, but also the idols of the heart. That's creating a God in your own image, creating God in your own mind instead of what God has revealed. And so verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness, through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. And so notice that phrase, God gave them up to uncleanness. Part of God's justice, his righteous justice or judgment upon sin is sometimes to allow sin to take its course, to allow this sinful nature of humanity to express itself and not being hindered by human justice in some way as a society follows that. And it says that, that they dishonor their own bodies between themselves. So, so the human nature, that fallen nature, expressed itself in sexual sins. And this really, this dishonored their bodies between themselves means any kind of sexual activity outside of a marriage between one man and one woman. So God says, you dishonored the bodies that I gave you, which you are supposed to be used to glorify God. Human society says, I don't want that. So God's justice, his justice sometimes is giving people up uh, to their own, their own sinful nature. And verse 25 says, they changed the truth of God into a lie. And, and they again worshipped and served the creature more than the creator. They got very self-centered. They were focused on humanity, ignored God, dis, dis, uh, you know, discarded God, didn't want anything. And they, they changed the truth of God into a lie. And this seems to be their worship had shifted. Uh, instead of what God had revealed about himself and seeking to honor God, they made up a God in their own minds, in their own hearts. In fact, it does seem to say they, they focused on the creature and may have been self. And so self had become the one who was idolized. Okay, it became first and foremost. And we go into that whole thing. There's a whole lot of that. And you see it everywhere today. But let's jump down to verse number 26. Uh, again, for this cause... God gave them up. Again, God gave them up. God gave them over. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That Yeah, verse um, to, to vile affection. So it seems to be a little bit more than verse 24 said, the uncleanness uh, of, of their own hearts and they dishonored their bodies in, in, in sexual sin. This time it says vile affections for even the women did change their natural use into that which is against nature and likewise also. So in the same manner, the men leaving the natural use of the woman to burn in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves the recompense of the air, which was, was meat. And so again, God says, I gave them up unto these things. I just let their sinful nature run its course. And, and, and the, the vile affections here are, are really what we would say today as the, uh, you know, within that realm, verse 26 and 27 of, 
of the LGBTQ uh, movement, I mean, that, that is a demonstration. When such things are, are promoted and become prominent in a society, it's not that God will judge them, though he will, okay, there's, there's more yet to come. But it's also saying, hey, that's part of my wrath. I turn people over to their human nature and they're not restrained from that in that society. Uh, that's part of my justice, uh, my righteous justice upon them. And then as you come to verse 28, again, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, they didn't want God to be in their textbooks. They didn't want God to be influencing them. They didn't want God to be part of the conversation. They didn't want God to be part of the, the thing that, that their society was directed toward and guided by. And so it says God, again, God gave them over. God gave them up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not Convenient. Convenient doesn't mean easy. It just means those things that are not proper, those things that are not fitting, those things that are not right. And so God says, hey, it's, you reprobate mind means, means it doesn't function the way it's supposed to. Or you could say in the context, the way God's intended it to be to, to, to work. And so they begin to think right is wrong and wrong is right. And they cannot tell the difference. In fact, verse 32, as it gives a big long list of things. Uh, they are filled with unrighteousness, fornication, verse 29, wickedness, covetousness, goes down through there, verse 30, backbiting, haters of God, despiteful, proud, so forth, verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, they don't keep their promises, they have no natural affection, the family is being broken apart and torn in, in pieces, implacable, they, 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 they're not reasonable, they, 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 they're stubborn, they're set on their ways, they're unmerciful, they don't, they don't care about other people or other people's property or other people, they just, you know, that's how it is. And then it says, who knowing the judgment of God. In other words, sometimes they still have in their mind, they realize, hey, this isn't right. There's something wrong with what we're doing. Okay? He says that they, they know that, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. In, in other words, there's something wrong with it. And some of this needs to be corrected or punished. But yet, they not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. They still do it. Even though they recognize, hey, there's something wrong with this, but it's okay. You know, I'm profiting from it. Hey, it's something wrong with this, but, but I'm getting a benefit from it. There's something wrong with this, in fact, I, you know, but, but you know what? It's enjoyable to watch, it's enjoyable to see, it's enjoyable to participate, they have pleasure in it. And so th this is the whole point here, as we look at what Paul says here, that, that sometimes God's righteous justice, that is his judgment upon sinful humanity, is to turn, turn humanity over to their sinful nature and not put hindrances on it to allow it to, to continue, to allow it to blossom, to allow it to bloom, and not, not have anything thing hindering it. And, and it is self-destructive. It's not that God delights in people destroying themselves or a society destroying itself. That's not what God delights in. But God says, you, you know, there's, there's a justice part that God says, hey, I am the just judge, the sovereign ruler, and I bring righteous judgment upon that which is evil. And sometimes he does it in this life. Now, chapter two, we're not going to go into it, but he does show, you, you could say, um, those who are moralists, those who are on the right side, they say, boy, that's evil, that's evil, that's evil, that's evil. And he points out those things in chapter one that are wrong. And, and they do so. And, I, you know, you could say a right side moralist. And God says, you know, but you're still a sinner. Because some things you condemn, you do yourself. And then he talks to the Jews. And he says, hey, Jews, you know, you, you're, not, you're not so great either. You know, you've got, you've got all the advantages of knowing what God says and you're, you're not following. And so he, he condemns really all humanity. Those that are wicked, those are moral, uh, those are immoral. Uh, the Jews who had, had the opportunities they had and yet they hadn't followed God's ways. And then we come to chapter three and I want you to notice verse four. Because um, he's thinking, okay, well, you know, but, but, but sometimes people just don't know. And sometimes people just don't, don't follow it. And, and you know, uh, so, so he says, isn't there an excuse there? And in, in verse 4, he says, God forbid, yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou, so this is speaking to God, that thou mightest be justified, or justified, be made righteous, okay, be seen as righteous, and made justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. And the context there of that quotation is, is God is judging a person, in fact, David, for his sin. And David says, Lord, you are right in what you're doing. You are correct in what you're saying, that I deserve judgment. 
And, and, and so that's the, the concept that, that Paul is, is also referring to, that God is perfectly justified in bringing judgment upon humanity for their sin. Now he continues here, and what he's doing here, he's sort of throwing out uh, what, what people would respond to what he's saying. And he says, whoa, what about this? Well, what about this? And so he's answering those arguments before, you know, as he's writing a letter, obviously, because he's not hearing the arguments, but maybe people he'd heard as he went through his ministry. But verse 5 through 7, but if our unrighteousness, if, if our personal human unrighteousness commends or demonstrates the righteousness of God, what should we say? Is God unrighteous that taketh vengeance? Now, vengeance, again, that's a term that means righteous justice. God bringing justice upon sin, his judgment. He said, I speak as a man. He said, God forbid. For then how shall God judge the world? For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why am I yet judged a sinner? And not rather, as we uh, slanderously say, and we jump down to the end of that, let us do evil that good may come. <laughs> whoa, 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 wait. Their damnation is just, their judgment, their, the, the righteous justice upon them is the right thing, as it says. They're, they're, it's, it's a just thing. It's a righteous thing when they are judged for their sin. So it's, what, it's, what, it's, what Paul is getting across is a very interesting argument. If my evil magnifies the righteous glory of God, then why does God judge me when my evil makes him look good? <laughs> it's sort of an absurd idea, but... But to the logical end, he says, hey, if that's true, then, then how is God going to judge any evil in the world? Because all evil magnifies his righteousness if he brings justice upon it. So, so how, how can he overlook your evil if he's not looking over ev other evil? Uh, it, it, it is interesting how we, we, uh, we selectively judge, but God says, I, I don't selectively judge. He says, I, I deal with everybody equally and fairly and properly. Uh, and, and so, you know, though it's a different idea, there is something else that's, that's in religious circles today. And that is that, that and it leads to the same end, though it's a different argument. They say, well, you know, uh, God, God loves everyone so much that he will never bring, you know, eternal judgment upon everyone. Well, I think the end of verse 8 tells us, you know, whose damnation is just. You know, God is right. He is righteous. And therefore, he is right in judging sin by however means he decides to do it. As it said back up there in verse number four, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings and mightest overcome when thou art judged. People say, well, God's not fair. Well, well wait, wait. No, you are evil and God is giving, bringing justice. So let's jump down a little bit. Uh, as you come down all the way down to verse number uh, 19. It says, now we know the what things soever the law saith. Now, what Paul's referring to is verses 10 through 18 that he just quoted numerous times, not just from the, the law of Moses, but really through the Psalms, through some of the prophets. And he, he quotes a number of verses starting in verse 10, as it is written. And then bang, verse 10, verse 11, verse 12, verse 13, verse 14, verse 15, verse 16, verse 17, verse 18. And he says, now we know that all those things about all the evils of men, he says, those are saying in the law, and it saith to them that are under the law, in other words, to the Jews, but it's to every man that every mouth, not just Jew, but also Gentile, every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. He said, that is why the law was written. These are God's righteous expectations. And when people do not do them, the law reveals you are guilty of crimes against God. And part of those crimes against God are when you have crimes against other people. In fact, it's interesting when, when, when someone has a, um, uh, you know, when, when they've broken the law. It doesn't say, you know, say they, they, they assaulted someone. Well, it doesn't talk about the assault against that person. It's a crime against the state because, you know, the all are one. And, and, and God says, hey, when, when I have made my, my commands deal with your relationship with people and also your relationship with me, and you break any of those, it's breaking my law. 
And so God says, hey, no one has kept God's law sufficiently. No one's kept it consistently. No one's kept it properly over the course of their life. And therefore, every man who, if they truly and honestly evaluate themselves based on God's law, they will say guilty as charged. So verse number 20 adds a little bit more to that. He says, therefore, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Remember, justified means made right. Okay, made right in, the, in his sight, in God's sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So God says, I provided my law, these standards of, what, of righteous conduct that I expect of humanity. He said, I, I want you to know them, but by knowing them, what happens is you have a knowledge of sin. Your mind and your heart senses its guilt. And folks, that's, when it comes down to it, that's why... Um, you know, Jesus said in John 3, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. They don't want the light of God's truth. And so God's, God's law, God's word, God's truth is, is often ignored. It's neglected. It's forsaken. It's forgotten. And, and, and I, you know, coming back to our country, you know, 4th of July, uh, yesterday. And, um, you know, we've taken, taken, you know, the prayer out of the schools. We don't want to talk to God. You know, we've taken, taken the Ten Commandments out of the courthouse or out of the school as well. We don't, we, don't want, we don't want his standards there. We don't want it, you know, and though they haven't taken it all out of, out of the halls of government, yet, you know, there, there's the Ten Commandments and, and a picture of Moses in the Supreme Court. There's, there's sketches and truths, uh, sketches and, and also, uh, you know, phrases from the scripture all, all through uh, Washington, D.C. And, and part of that was there was a day when, when at least, you know, they weren't necessarily Christian. They weren't, it wasn't necessarily a, 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 a theocracy. As, as Israel was, we know those things weren't so, but we, but, but we do know there was a consciousness of God and there was a sense of God. And when those things are all taken out, um, it's, it's because some people say, hey, I, I don't want, I don't want to hear and I don't want to know that my, my choices and my decisions and my way of life are wrong in the eyes of God and therefore I stand condemned before him. I stand guilty before him. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to know that. I want to eat, drink, and be merry. I want to enjoy my life. And so I don't want anything to do with God. And so God's law puts on display the righteousness of God and how God will, will deal with sinners. And the proof of his righteousness is when he does bring that just judgment. And, and he would not be righteous if, if the Lord um, did not bring justice upon that which was sinful. So, so that's a demonstration of his righteous justice upon sinful actions, both in time and in eternity. Okay, so, so that's the second point we've seen. So we saw God's righteous character in his, in his person and in his desire and in his actions. And then we see God's righteous justice, both in time and eternity, that he will bring that to bear. And then last of all, I want to call it God's righteous sacrifice. And we'll stay here in Romans chapter 3. And as we, we begin, we understand through God's written word uh, that, that no person can reach the status of righteous in the eyes of God. But God has another plan by which he can still bring people back into a personal relationship with him. Because humanity and their sin are separated from God. And in that separation, they do not have a blessed relationship with him, a place where they can enjoy God on a personal level. And so that's because of sin. And, and that sin, when separated from God in time, and we die in that condition, then we'll be separated from God in eternity. And so God says, I, I want to I fix that. And so God had a plan, and he made this plan out of love. And so in verse 21, we'll just jump right in there. It says, but now the righteousness of God without the law. In other words, apart from the law, apart from following the law, there is a means by which God's righteousness can be, um, can be given to humanity. Uh, somehow that meet that standard. And so God even declared, it says, for by the, uh, 
I lost my place. Verse 20, uh, 21, uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So even this righteousness without the law was declared in the Old Testament. God had talked about it. God said it was coming. So verse 22, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith in Jesus Christ. So somehow we can meet that standard of God that God has set, that righteous standard, and it's done by faith in Jesus Christ. And it's for everybody who believes upon him. And then he says, for there is no difference. And, it, and that probably not only points to what he had just said. In other words, everybody is saved the same way. But also the reason that we're all saved the same way is because of verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's unto all and upon all them that believe. Uh, but it's also, it's, it's for us. We need it because we're all sinners. Okay, and we've come short of the glory of God. Everyone has Sin. Everyone has missed the mark of God righteous standards. And that's the idea of they've come short of the glory of God. Now one aspect of God's glory is his righteousness. And that righteousness that he demands to be in his presence, the righteousness he demands of humanity in order to walk with him, that God says, hey, you, you've come short of that. You, 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 you've not met that standard. So verse 24. Being justified, so remember, justified means to be made righteous before God. How does that come about? Well, notice it says, you're being justified freely. You don't have to pay for it. It's something God gives as a gift. It says it's by his grace, and that means it's not by works that you perform. So it's freely, it's by his grace, it's through the redemption, and redemption means paying a price well, who paid the price? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. He paid the price. What was that price? I think the next verse tells us. Whom God hath set forth, and that would go with John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, that's his motivation in all this, that he gave his only begotten son. He hath set forth his, uh, set forth his son to be a propitiation. And that propitiation means that Jesus took the punishment that righteous justice, that righteous judgment that you and I deserve, Jesus took it upon himself for us. And, 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 and that, that what we deserve, and he hung on the cross, and when he cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There was no voice from heaven at that time. There, there was no sound, there was silence. But the scripture is loud and clear, okay? And, and, and the truth, it's, it's said it over and over again. He, he, he was dying, he was paying the price, he was paying the penalty for those sinners in verse 23, who, for, for all of us who have sinned and come short of that glory of God's righteous standard and his righteous expectation. We deserve justice, we deserve judgment, we deserve that, that punishment. But it was paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does say that in order for that to truly happen and you to have a restored relationship with God and a, a, a assurance of a home in heaven in God's presence. It says there in verse 25, uh, he set forth to be propitiation through faith in his blood. Faith, that's the response, that's believing. You need to believe in his blood. And that, that goes back to the cross. It's not that you believe in his, his hemoglobin or his, um, you, you know, his white blood cells or the red blood cells or the platelet. You know, I'm getting all used to that with my mom going through this time, um, you know, and all those tests being done concerning her bone marrow and everything like that. And it's not that you believe in that aspect of things, but it's pointing to what happened there at the cross and the blood that he shed and the violence he went through to die in, in your place. That's what, and you need to believe that. That is salvation. You cannot be saved for time or eternity if you do not believe that Jesus suffered the penalty for your rotten, wicked sin and my rotten, wicked sin. That's the only means. You've got to have faith in that blood that that is what you believe. He died for you. He was a substitute for you. The substitutionary death of the Lord Jesus Christ is what you have to believe. And if you do that, Notice what it goes on to say. To declare his, God's, righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. See, God would not retain a righteous status 
if he did not deal with sin. He would not be a righteous judge if he overlooked and ignored the wrongs that were done. Now, God has been very patient. He's been long-suffering. He has been forbearing or overlooking. But, but understand when it comes to sin and sinners and eternity, God is, not, it's not, God is not ignorant. He's not overlooking. Sin must be punished if he's to remain righteous. And he has done that by putting the punishment for your sin upon his son. Therefore, verse 26, to declare... He says, he mentioned up in verse 25, to declare his righteousness, to declare I say at this time. He says, I want to repeat this again. God's righteousness. In what way? That he might be just. And that's another word that means uh, righteous. That, that God retains his righteous status. He is a just judge. He brought righteous justice or righteous judgment upon sin. Okay, so he did that. And therefore, so, so he, he still... Just and he's also the justifier of him believeth in Jesus. In other words, if you believe what Christ did on your behalf, God remains righteous, which is very important. Okay, he's still the, the, the moral center of the universe. Okay, and he is that because the sin that you committed that must be judged was judged upon his son. So God remains just. He did punish sin. And he transferred your sin to him. But he also, because your sin has now been put over upon Jesus Christ, therefore he can say, hey, welcome home. He can declare you as innocent before the law because all the law's justice was paid upon Jesus Christ. And so God is, is, is very clear here. Forgiveness of your sin, the remission of sins. Is, is not because God overlooked or ignored or forgot about your sins, but because they were, justice was brought to bear upon them up, up, through Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty for your sin. And what's neat is you go into chapter 4, we'll not go there, but chapter 4 declares that not only was my sin put upon Jesus, but Jesus' righteousness was given to me. That's why I have a right standing with God. I am justified. What a wonderful truth. But still here in chapter 3, verse 27, where's boasting then? Are you going to brag about this? Well, no, it's excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. See, you do the works, you, 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 you earn it, somehow you can brag about yourself, but God says that's not going to happen in heaven. It's not going to happen in my family. Why? Because the only means that you can come in here is that your, your sin had to be paid for, and the only way it got paid for, at least appropriated to you, is by your faith. Verse 28, therefore we conclude that man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law, without doing deeds according to God's commands. So God made a righteous sacrifice on your behalf because he loved you. Your sin, if you believe the truth about Jesus' death on your behalf and then of course his resurrection as well, you're no longer condemned. You're not under that condemnation. That's the gospel. That's salvation. Boy, that's why we praise God. But as a child of God, there's something else just really quick that we want to make mention of. And that is the fact that um, as a child of God, God not only gives you a right standing with God, but he wants to impart to you a righteous character, a righteous uh, an ability to follow a path of righteousness. And, and let's just jump over to chapter 6 real quick. I want to read a couple verses, make a couple comments, and then we'll be through. Verse uh, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. So he's talking to the Christian. He said, hey, Christian, you have a choice now. You didn't have a choice before, but now you have a choice. Don't yield your members, your hands, your legs, your arms, your, you know, whatever, just your mind. Don't yield any of the members of, of your body uh, as an instrument to do things that are unrighteous. Instead, yield yourselves unto God, okay? So, so yield yourself to God. Give yourself, submit to God, follow God. As those that are alive from the dead, that's what you are. You were dead in your sins, but now you're alive in Christ. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So he says, use your, use your body, use your mind, use your heart, use all that you are to do righteous things. And then if you jump down to verse number uh, 19, it reiterates the same thing in a little different way. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. That's the weakness there of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity. In other words, before you got saved, as you yielded to sin, it just became a habit and kept growing and growing. So now, 
as a child of God. So yield your members as servants to righteousness. In other words, keep doing that every day. Keep doing that. Form a pattern. Form a, uh, form a, a habit in your life. And it'll go unto holiness. Your righteousness will, will move forward into holiness. And so that's what God tells us to do. Now, chapter 7 tells about that struggle between we have between right and wrong as a Christian. And yet, chapter 8 and verse number 4, once again, we'll mention righteousness here. So notice what it says there in verse 4. Um, in fact, verse 3 talks about Christ and dying for us and so forth. Um, took care of the penalty and, the, and really notice what he says now in verse 4. That the righteousness of the law. Hmm. The righteousness that God expects from a Christian's life. The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. How? Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So as a Christian, the Holy Spirit indwells you as you yield to him, as, as really those earlier passages talk about it. It doesn't say yield to the Spirit, but that would, would include that. To yield to the Spirit of God so that he can fulfill, he will empower you to fulfill the righteous standard God expects from humanity. Not perfection, but a direction and an empowerment to accomplish what God's will is. And so how do you do that? Well, you don't focus on the law. You focus on your relationship with God. You focus on yielding to Him. You focus on, on performing those expressions of love, which is a very positive and righteous thing to do. And as you focus there, the Spirit of God will empower you to do it. So, so in this message this morning, as we, we close out this thought about righteousness in relationship to God, God is righteous and He expects humanity to live by His standard of righteousness. Righteousness does matter today. Because when we don't follow that, when we don't meet that standard, God calls that sin. And, and he will bring righteous justice upon all sin, sometimes in time, but always in eternity. And if you are lost, and if you are a, you know, in that sin still, as you know, without ever trusting Christ, and you die in that state, then God says you'll never spend time with me in eternity and it'll be in a place called hell because your sin deserves eternal condemnation because you've sinned against an eternal God. But God in love made a plan that you can righteously escape that judgment and it was through the sacrifice of Christ, the propitiation for your sins. And if you put faith in that, that event, his blood, as it says there in Romans 3. If you trust him, there is no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I hope you would. And if you have trusted him, praise him for that. And he says, now live for me. Yield yourselves. Follow me. Yield to the Spirit of God. And he will empower you to live in a way that pleases God in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. And I pray if anybody is is listening to this who has never trusted Christ, I pray they would. For those who have trusted you, Lord, I pray that you'd help them to love you more because of the wonderful transaction that has been made through Christ and his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you again for your love and your goodness. Help us to live for you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.